meet on on Monday and do more review is uh, we need to talk about what we read for today with uh, Charles Taylor section six from the bulwarks of belief. So we took a little step backward to kind of fill in and get more information about uh, about the his theory of disenchantment uh, of increased secularization and what was going on especially in the medieval times prior to the Reformation, which, which began the process that ended up in secularization, okay? So the first thing I wanted to do is, is just kind of review three big ideas that, that you will need to understand and tap into in writing your midterm answers. The first one, and I think it's probably close to the first one we talked about, was this idea of fullness, and that you know he uses this term to describe the desire that people have for completion, for a feeling that they have actually uh, lived a meaningful um, and purposeful life, and that they have reached something to something beyond themselves. Okay, he talks about the the feeling in the modern world that what we're doing, even though it's productive, doesn't seem to actually be satisfying enough because it doesn't seem to transcend our, our normal, everyday uh, needs, wants, and desires. So he says the people look for fullness and have in the past mostly looked for, for this feeling of fullness from transcendence, from, from God or some, some religious experience so the ability to kind of tap into something truly beyond ourselves. Uh, but within the, quote, imminent frame, that is the secular uh, world, they look for it more in their careers, for instance, and in, in maybe in their family life, and in, in things that they do in this world that they can look and accomplish. But, but uh, he questions the satis whether people are satisfied with it. Um, for our purposes, I just want to remind you that for the ancient philosophers we've covered and most of the early and medieval Christian political thinkers that we will be covering, fullness was to be found in something beyond our immediate selves, in the transcendent, in something transcendent. Plato, in his discussion of the forms or ideas, and of course we talked about Neoplatonism through Plotinus, with this idea of you know the search for the one and coming closer to the one through the use of reason, sort of peeling away the layers of, of the external world to get back to that, you know, really the spiritual center. Um, and even Aristotle's um, philosophy of the telos that's within everything, you know, that everything in the creative world has this natural end and that we can uh, sort of see a plan or a purpose in nature through understanding teleology, right? Uh, leads to the doctrine of natural law, and that becomes, you know, the idea that God authored, you know, the universe and within it implanted the sort of order that you can read and you can understand, and in doing so you can understand the mind of the creator, okay? So at any rate, I mean, we can say most of the people that we will be studying in this class lived within this, this idea of fullness as, as coming from something beyond themselves, something transcendent. But we will find in some of the later medieval authors beginnings of questioning that. And that is partly what Charles Taylor is discussing discussing in this section, that even within pre-Reformation Christianity, you begin to see tension uh, and a sort of pulling towards, you know, this worldly uh, practices and actions, um, uh, and we'll see how that works. But another important uh, term to remember, terms to remember <coughs> right now, um, is when Taylor discusses enchantment and versus disenchantment, okay? Um, remember that in the pre-modern experience of enchantment, 
he actually uses the term magic, and I, I like that because it, you know for the modern mind it's kind of hard to imagine what he's talking about otherwise, but he says there's a pre-modern experience of both good and evil magic in the experience of most people. Good magic is the magic of the church and you know the things that the church does to uh, protect people from evil, okay? Um, such magic might be, you know, the cons uh, transubstantiation of the host in the Eucharist, the idea that the priest is able, through the words of institution, to change the Eucharist from plain bread to the body of Christ. Or it might mean, you know, the blessing of holy water, which, which then, by using it, blesses the people, okay? Um, it might mean uh, the use of, of, of veneration of certain things, of relics um, that bring a sense of holiness. It might mean, you know, monks living in a monastery doing nothing but praying for people, right, and fulfilling that function of warding away evil for the people. But at any rate, um, there was all sorts of this going on, and there was a fear of evil magic evil forces which you then had to you know find a way to to propitiate to, to to you know ward off or to get out somehow through this good magic okay everybody on board with that okay um, probably you've watched TV shows about this period of time or movies where you've seen some of this and of course if if any of you are Catholics you know Catholics do 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 some of these things. It's just a little less understood or it's not probably experienced in quite the same way as it would have been back then. Um, the modern experience, by contrast of disenchantment, involves more and more, it's gradual, but more and more of a debunking of this magic, both good and evil, in favor of a more direct understanding and relationship with the divine. So that you know, the, the need for, I guess the central point there is the need for people to do things, intermediary, starts to go away or starts to be questioned, okay? So do we need to have special blessings and rituals, okay? Do we need to have relics and statues, okay? Even within the medieval Catholic Church, there were movements and times which you will see in your future readings where these things were questioned and where there was a notion that this is not exactly, these things are a deviation from, not, not transubstantiation so much, but a lot of the other things are a deviation from the purity of the original faith, okay? And maybe unnecessary, or maybe they even get in the way of, of people's ability to have this direct, um, direct contact with God. Um, again, just a reminder, within this framework of enchantment versus disenchantment, even the ancient philosophers lived in an enchanted world. Okay? They may have questioned some parts of it, but you can see by reading them that it was far from gone. Right? Um, through the world of, of platonic ideals, and transcendent realities, a world of gods, and laws of nature of divine origin. And of course, the Neoplatonists, as I mentioned before, uh, with their goal of unity uh, with the one, I mean, these are very mystical aspirations, you know. Um, so if we had to place them between enchantment and disenchantment, they'd still be in, on the side of enchantment for the most part. Any questions about that so far? Is there a differentiation between disenchantment and the subtraction story, or is that? In, in Taylor's rendition, yes, there is. He's going to argue that the typical subtraction story, which he's really criticizing, says that what really happened was, you know, science came along, and science just showed us that you know, these things weren't real, that you couldn't find any, you know, physical evidence for holy water being different than regular water or, 
you know, I mean, in the classic case, we, we discovered that, you know, the, the world revolves around the sun and not the other way around, and this contradicted the, the, the older theological notion. And so that's the typical subtraction story. We just learned these new things, and so we began to take away these layers of superstition. But what Taylor's going to argue is that, yes, that had an effect, but way prior to that, the Christian demand, this continuing compulsion for Christian purity itself, which came, which was in an existence far beyond be before the Reformation, but culminated in the Reformation, that itself leads to secularization. And th that's the novelty of this theory. And it's a sort of tragic theory for those who are, you know, who are concerned about de uh, secularization. Um, is that you know this compulsion of Christianity to continue to to um, purify itself of any and all superstition and mysticism and intermediary and to have this direct connection with God ultimately leads to a questioning of whether you need God at all because as you become more pure and you find that the lay people can become more pure morally, that they can understand how to do it, um, the less you need first these intermediary people like priests and their magic, and then secondly, if you can do it yourself, you may not even need God. Now, he's not going there yet, but that's where he ends up. So yeah, there's a distinction there. You're welcome. I mean, Dis disenchantment is, is really more of a label. Subtraction story is a cause, and disenchantment versus enchantment is really more of a description of what the reality is, right? Yeah, right. Subtract, subtraction story is a theory about how we get disenchantment. That's yeah, it. right. Mm -hmm. And his theory is that it's not a straight subtraction story. It's really quite um, tragic. And it reminds me, just as an aside, which I won't spend much time on, but Nietzsche actually says that Christianity, in effect, has the ability to destroy itself because it is so, it is so focused upon discovering the truth and the idea that the truth will set you free. But in the pursuit of truth, you may ask so many questions and delve so deeply that most people find there is nothing there for them to hang on to. I'm not saying that's right, but I'm just saying that it it resonates with what Charles Taylor is saying here, that you've got this compulsion for purity and truth, and you don't know where it's going to lead. They thought it was going to lead towards more piety, more pure piety, right? But for some people, it led off in the direction of secular perfection, you know. Um, okay, Any, anybody else need or want to say anything else about it. Okay. It's a it's kind of a contrarian argument that you don't I mean that's the novelty of it, you know, is that we normally blame the scientists and the, you know, yeah, the humanists for the destruction of faith. Whereas in his view, it it, it the destruction of it to the extent that it's happened is also partly coming from within it in a particular interpretation of it. Okay, uh, another term, another set of terms that are important for us now, the porous versus the buffered self. And this goes along with enchantment and disenchantment. The porous self is this idea that in our enchanted past, human beings were open to and felt subjected to external forces beyond their control, and our goal was to somehow understand and influence and control these forces to the best we could, okay? And so the need for intermediary rituals and, you know, uh, lots of magic, okay? But still, you can imagine living within this world, you're never you're never going to be terribly self-confident about your position in that 
you're not going to have the opinion that you can control that world absolutely, okay? Um, in the modern age, we get this notion that the, the self has become interior, the forces once seen as external are seen as arising from within human psychology, okay? So we say to ourselves, and, and Hobbes did some of this too, he said, you know, a lot of times the phantasms that, that people believe are real, the ghosts, the voices that they hear come from physical ailments that they have, you know, maybe maybe something I ate last night, you know, led to this dream or this vision or hallucination or whatever it may be. He was, he was very skeptical about all of it. Um, and therefore, it's really in, in my mind, a figment of my imagination. And imagination has been diminished to being something very personal and, and really almost biological. Um, and so, this also begins to happen even within Christianity itself. Again, you know, the questioning of whether people ought to believe in ghosts and spirits and demons and things like that, or if this is really more just superstition, right? Um, and whether if it's harmful, if it leads away from a direct and good foundation in, in belief in God, it may be something to, you know, move away from, okay? Um, again, Plato and Aristotle and many early Christian and medieval thinkers did not think in terms of a buffered self, but of a porous self. They were still living in an era where there were outside forces, whether they were the gods or the platonic ideas or the, the you know, the laws of nature, themselves, okay? So, um, the buffered self, as we move into the modern world, literally creates uh, a wall between us and the external experiences, okay? Um, but they're not needed if the one experience you need is direct encounter with God himself. Does that make sense? So as we move towards the Protestant Reformation, what was the Protestant Reformation about? Luther, many things, but one of the big ones was, you know, people don't need all this stuff. They need to study the Bible and they need to pray and they need to have a direct encounter with God. Okay? Which is still something transcendent, but it's narrowed down to this personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Right? Okay. So, as his argument unfolds, we'll see more of the implications of, of that as he sees them. All right, so those are three you know, sets of terms to remember that you'll need to be able to use. And remember, you've got that glossary that I put in the announcements that has those and more um, in them. Okay, so let's turn towards section six and we'll just get started with this. Um, so in section six, he begins to explain how the, quote, drive to reform began within the medieval church and led to the ultimate reformation. Okay. And I can tell you from having read medieval writings, and you'll be able to see this as you move into them, that's really true. That we, you know, we've been taught, I think many of us we taught the shorthand version of, of history of Europe, think that the Reformation just sort of came out of nowhere and, you know, shazam, everything just changed like that. But actually there were many attempts at Reformation throughout the centuries in the medieval church. And some of those writers got away with it too. It's also a, you know, a sort of mythology that every time anybody wrote anything that contradicted the church's um, orthodoxy at the time, that they were burned at the stake, you know. <laughs> That happened some of the time, but it depended on who was in charge, right? And some of the time, they didn't. It was tolerated. And so some of the writers that your your eyes are gonna bug out when you read what some of these people say, you know, direct criticism of the Pope and of the church hierarchy for, you know, sort of perpetuating what they consider to be superstitious ideas or corrupt ideas. Um, and they weren't 
killed or driven out or anything. So, um, but never did they also, never did they get enough traction to create a major change. Yeah. Uh, he mentions Wycliffe and the laws. Um, he was, he wasn't burned at the stake, but his body was uh, removed from the ground and destroyed uh -huh. to, because of his heresies. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, right. I mean, things like that happen. I'm just saying over time, things like that didn't always happen, right? I mean, <laughs> Some got lucky. Some got lucky, and it depended upon who was, part of, you know, who was in charge at the time. Some of them had other fish to fry too. They weren't particularly all that interested in theology. <laughs> so, um, so it just depended. You know, what happened to Galileo? He got put under house arrest. You know, he he wasn't burned at the stake. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I mean, Mel Brooks gives us, you know, the sort of shorthand view of the, you know, the Inquisition. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it went on and on forever and ever, but it was sporadic, is all I'm saying. And so you see these periods of time where people are able to criticize and question, and it lays the foundation for the Reformation and the Counter Reformation. Some of those ideas of the Reformation, they didn't come out of the blue. They had they had predecessors. And the Counter-Reformation, which is the Church's Reformation of itself in the wake of the Reformation, um, also you know, drew from, from these ideas. OK. Um, so anyway, what was behind the drive to reform? That's the question that he asks. And here's a quote from uh, page 61 and 62. He says, what I'm calling reform here expressed a profound dissatisfaction with the hierarchical equilibrium between lay life and the renunciative vocations, which would be the, the priests and nuns that you know, cloister themselves and, and sacrifice for their you know, time and lives for others. In one way, this was quite understandable. This equilibrium between the lay people and the orders involved accepting the masses of people were not going to live up to the demands of perfection. They were going to be carried, in a sense, by the perfect. Okay, remember Charles Taylor talking about how, you know, the people, um, say, in uh, Buddhist communities, they'd, they'd support the monks by feeding them, right? In this context, the, you know, the parishioners would give money, they'd pay tithes to support the monks. Um, even now, people invite the priests. Priests, uh, generally, unless they want to, never have to eat by themselves. They eat at everybody's homes all the time. I mean, they just uh, get, you know, everybody kind of supports them. And the, I don't think this is so much the case now, but in the past. So when people supported them in these ways, they felt as though they were earning grace, right? That they were earning God's approval indirectly through their support for these people who were holier than themselves, right? That's what he means by they were being carried, in a sense, by the perfect. And he says, there is something in this which runs against the very spirit of Christian faith, okay? Now, what would that be? I mean, for some of you, if you're not Christians, maybe you don't know what, what he's talking about here, but or maybe you know enough about Christianity to kind of have an idea. Why would this bifurcation between the laity who don't have to be perfect and the, the monks, let's say, who are perfect, and you know, we support them so they kind of carry us along and they they pray for us and that's how we're gonna get into heaven. What about that might run into trouble with the spirit of the Christian faith? It almost, have a guess? Like, it almost draws a parallel to um, like penitence and like getting out of purgatory and that sort of thing. Like you're you're not doing things because it's a good deed. You're doing things because you know that you're gonna or you feel like you're gonna get a reward. Okay. Reward out yeah. of it, yeah, and that's essentially wrong in the Christian faith. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's sort of like a, 
could be corrupted into a sort of slot machine type of thing where all I have to do is pay this amount and I get off the hook and don't have to worry about God anymore. I've done my bit, right? I don't have to even really think about what my motivations. Yeah. Yeah, were you gonna say something? Um, yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm a few years out of theology classes, um, but from what I remember, uh, I think everyone basically is supposed to be like made perfectly in God's image. So if you're in a sense sort of attributing perfection to like a higher class of people, you're almost giving them a quality that you're denying to yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of saying, I can't be God-like, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, whereas they are more godlike than I am. And that's kind of, I don't know, I'd say fickly antithetical to, to Christian beliefs. Yeah, so. it, it kind of, it, it really kind of is. You know, if, if people were all created by God, uh, so everybody's a child of God, equal in that way, right? Um, uh, why do we need to have some people who are holier than others? And if God created all people, why aren't all people equally capable then of being being holy and, and, and doing what is right in God's eyes? Yeah, yeah. And also, like, it's like there's a strong sense of community when we do nowadays. So it's like if a single person does commit sin, then it harms the whole community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is a drive to be free of sin within for individuals to, to save the community. So that having some people that are completely free of sin, some people that can do some kind of sin to a limited amount, uh, like it still ruins the whole the whole community. Like uh, I think like how many Israelites were persecuted for. Some people being uh, uh, sinning, the whole community was mm -hmm. Right. So, so in other words, are you saying that just because the monks are praying doesn't yeah. mean that the whole community truly is yeah. purified by that? And the older notion that anybody who sins pollutes yeah. and, and it needs to be rectified. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're not off the hook, or they shouldn't be off the hook, right? I mean, you can see how this could become very uh, <coughs> a justification, a justificatory or whatever of, of people just doing whatever the heck they wanted as long as they, you know, paid their tithes or, you know, prepared meals for the monks, and they could go off and sin and gamble or do whatever it is that they wanted to do. Um, and feel like it's all it's all good. That would be a perverted or corrupted notion of it, but certainly, I'm sure it happened. Um, so yeah, it it does. And I think even people within the church it is what Taylor's going to argue is even many people within within the Catholic Church understood that this was not a perfect arrangement and didn't perfectly reflect the intentions of the Christian faith. Um, uh, and as time went by, movements began within it that questioned this and started to do things differently. Um, and he mentions this development that as we move into the uh, late Middle Ages, we get the development of the economy, more of a middle class developed, the gentry who weren't nobles but also weren't poor, and they were learning, they were, they were more literate. And so, you know, they began to study up on the faith and began to aspire to higher levels of understanding and practice of the faith, more along the lines of the higher elites who practiced more contemplation and prayer and attempted to achieve this more pure holiness than the the, the so-called vulgar masses, you know, who, who, who did not. Um, and so this, this, the creation or the advent of this new group of people pushed this uh, uh, drive even further, okay? So, let's see, we're out of time. So this is where I'll start up and on, uh, on Monday, we'll finish this and then 
we can talk about the midterm a bit on Monday too. And I'll have the sign up sheet for everybody on Monday to uh, sign up for appointments on Wednesdays and Friday. Mm -hmm. And now I'll start recording. <laughs> so we needed to finish up our discussion of, uh, of Charles Taylor's, that's section six um, that we just got started on last time. Um, I'm sorry, I'll have to look back here. But, we, but I had made the point that Taylor talks about how as, as we move through the Middle Ages, and we get more people of this new gentry class or bourgeois class. We have more people who are literate, who are making money, who want to be more independent. And this is a factor in the development of, of uh, new spirituality. It's a factor in, in the eventual Protestant Reformation, too. Because, you know, there, the more people who are literate, who feel like they're sort of self-empowered, the more, more likely they are to ask why they aren't more personally involved in their salvation, see? So it's a big factor all around. And I like this um, spot on page 63 where uh, Taylor talks about the types of actions that the lay people had done, the sort of actions as opposed to um, sort of the internal more private uh, piety. He says they included things like fasting and also abstaining from work at the appropriate times related to Sundays and feast days as well as seasons like Lent and Advent. And they included attending Mass on Sunday, penance and communion at least once a year at Easter time. These were <coughs> prescribed actions. That means they were required of every lay person. But there was as well a rich gamut of devotional acts which people threw themselves into, liturgical acts like creeping to the cross on Good Friday, blessing candles on candle mass. And if you've never seen creeping to the cross, look up via, what is it called? I'll, I'll think of it and send it to you later. There's a place in Portugal where people literally either walk or in some cases crawl um, on their way. Uh, there's more than one place like that. Um, blessing of candles, taking part in Corpus Christi parades, and then there was a whole host of devotions to saints, cults of relics. Relics are typically either pieces of, um, of, of an actual body of a saint or something that they touched, or the cross or something like that. Prayers to the Virgin in which we shade off into an area which was more and more a field of controversy. So these are the kind of things that the lay people did if they wanted to kind of um, ensure their, you know, their salvation their, and to participate in some way in their quest for holiness. But notice that their external acts and the idea for many of them would it be as long as I do these things, I'm kind of safeguarded here. I, okay, I do what the church tells me to do, which is confess at least once a year, go to mass at least once a year, and maybe if I'm feeling like I need a little extra protection, I'll, I'll do one of these other devotional acts. And the act itself has a sort of, using Taylor's term, good magic that protects you, right? And it was this that a growing number of people were beginning to question previously there had been, you know, the elite, so to speak, the spiritual elite, where the priests and monks and the nuns who practiced more of this internal, devotional, and more intellectual, intellectualizing, interior spiritual life. And the people did these things and supported the, the, the uh, you know, the clergy. And so there was this symbiotic relationship. More and more, uh, this class of people who are rising up are are beginning to say, well, look, this is kind of like not good enough. You know, why is it that we have this distinction between the so those so-called you know elites who have this more direct relationship with God, but we have to go through them, or we have to kind of confine ourselves to these what seemed as we move along maybe a little bit more superstitious ways of of um, you know, expressing, uh, expressing piety. So up comes certain religious orders out of the Catholic Church that emphasize 
a new level of piety or holiness for lay people, okay? To kind of like address this demand with a new hope that it's not just the priests and the nuns, you know, uh, who can kind of take part in this higher spiritual life. And so that's what we mean by, or he uses the term, a rage for order, a order within religious societies like the Dominicans and the Franciscans, but also order amongst the masses of people to give them more spiritual discipline so they actually were able to become closer to the ideal, if that makes sense, okay? So <clears throat> the Dominicans and the Franciscans he mentions as religious orders who didn't stay cloistered inside of their uh, you know, their monasteries and nunneries, but went, or yeah, yeah, monasteries, but went out and traveled. Uh, mendicant is a term that he uses. Mendicant just means traveling, okay? Instead of staying and cloistering and praying and, and saying, well, we're doing our job to save the people in this way, they go out and they start preaching to the people and trying to teach them a higher level of holiness. And they also emphasize like good works, charity, helping people, and they emphasize poverty. So most of them, mendicant also kind of uh, infers, they lived off of the, you know, um, more or less the charity of the people, right? So they'd stay in their homes and they'd eat their food and they, they had, took vows of poverty. So they, they went against a lot of the church hierarchy in this regard, or should maybe not have went against is too strong, but did something different in that they weren't about, you know, building big churches and artwork and things like that. Um, they were trying to live a life of, of, of real self-denial, okay? So, one of the outcomes of this, the vow of poverty, the emphasis upon, you know, going out and living with the people and dealing with them and, and the higher spirituality is a downgrading of the physical world, right? Of course, the churches, the statues, the paintings, you know, if you're out traveling around, those mean less, the people mean more, okay? Uh, but also, kind of building on that, a downgrading of things of the body generally. So, for instance, a new emphasis on, uh, you know, condemning things like gluttony or, you know, sexual uh, promiscuity, okay? Or um, too much of a vanity, you know, too much of an attention to how you look and so on and so forth. Um, and so, and all of this is good. Now, I, you know, I mean, it was considered good and because it was more pure, kind of getting back to the original message of, of, uh, of the religion, okay? Um, Taylor uses the term memento mori, which I just wanted to bring in here because it's kind of a cool, some of you may have already um, heard of this. Maybe, I don't know, some of you may have had Dr. Um, Donnelly for DAS 300. That was, okay, so you remember him bringing in pictures of these the memento mori pictures, skeletons, and what was that? I think maybe he changed it up by the time you were taking him. Well, but he used to have this whole gallery of these things because during the Middle Ages, starting at about the 14th century, you get more and more of an emphasis on the fact that people are gonna die and you know the things of this world are just not important. You need to remember this, so it really remember. It means remember that you're going to die, right? There's a great Mel Brooks uh, movie, uh, History of the World, Part Two, um, <laughs> where I think it's just I forget Justinian, the Emperor. Anyway, as he's walking in and he's you know won his latest battle, somebody is there saying, "Remember, thou art mortal. Remember, thou art mortal," because of course an, a Roman emperor was. You know, kind of inclined to thinking he was a god, so you had to remind him of this. Mm -hmm. So um, these pictures uh, became a way, and I'll show you a couple of them in a minute, but uh, they became a way of contemplating your mortality. Um, let's see, top of page 69, just a little bit on the sexual side of things. He says, whatever the motor, the new spirituality had an individuating side. This was 
perhaps also reflected in an increasing emphasis on sexual purity, which begins to gain on sins of anger, violence, and dislocation of fraternal bonds. In other words, sexual purity became more important than some of these other things, right? And can you see how this would be individuating? Okay. In other words, it's about me and my individual sexual purity. Okay. Am I am I a virgin if I'm not married? You know. Uh, it, I mean, people went to great lengths to you know if there was any hint of lack of virginity in women, right? It became a cause of you know maybe this person could never get married. So people were very, became very fastidious about, you know, proving their virginity. Um, okay, so the emphasis there on individuating, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing to remain pure? How are you disciplining your life? You see the change? Previously, it's how are you supporting the church and the monks who pray for you because you're a sinful person who's probably not going to change very much. So you have to do all these things to kind of hope that you'll be able to survive the judgment, right? But now it's it's more, you know, you are a sinful person, but there's many things that you really can do. You need to change your life. You need to become better. So there's more of a focus on that, okay? Um, Here's a one picture I found on the internet that's kind of typical of the artwork of this period. You know, remember you're going to die, and you're going to hopefully be risen um, if if you if you have passed muster, right? If you've been saved, and uh, so some of them don't. I mean, this is a more hopeful one. I thought I'd feature that because. Some of them can get quite gruesome. You know, they're skeletons being tormented by demons in, in hell or in purgatory. Um, this one seems to be, you know, more about uh, resurrection. But it certainly reminds you that your body's going to decay. You're going to be in a coffin someday, and it's going to wake you up. So here's another one uh, from the... Uh, 16th century, these were very popular to have a, uh, you know, person who wanted their portrait done holding a skull or having a skull sitting next to, next to them and their, their own personal way of contemplating their own demise, right? Remember Hamlet, to be or not to be, you know, how it's often like he's actually holding a skull, kind of comes from the same, same tradition, so. And here's a contemporary one. As far as I can tell, this is not actually old, but I kind of like it because it does the same thing. It's a, maybe, probably contemporary Gothic, but it's a skull, but, and within it you know, is this beautiful woman, so you get to contemplate the beauty of the flesh, but the flesh is very fleeting, right? It's, we're all going to end up goo and then dust. <laughs> Well, sorry, that's what I know. It's terrible. It's the truth, right? So, so, then, so less, so, so, you know, not so much, uh, the message was not so much emphasis on beauty and frivolity. Let's get serious here. Let's think about the eternity to come and not the momentary things of life, okay? So, in addition, there was then a shift towards being less, I, I'm using the term superstitious, but I hate it, but I think that maybe at least it gets the point across. Less, you know, fear of things like spirits and ghosts that come out at night in the graveyard and whatnot, and more direct facing your own death and realizing that your relationship with God is the only thing that will save you, you know, when you die, okay? so more and more people were discouraged from you know these rituals and celebrations and festivities that they had surrounding death you know like the one we talked about last time that turned into halloween <laughs> right um, it, but uh, more just on the quiet realization that you need to get uh, get yourself straightened out right so this meant more personal private devotion which means more emphasis on the individual again. These, these things can take place in the privacy of your own home, 
or in some confessional space or something like that and do not have to be done in a corporate way or in a public way, okay? Also, contributing that, remember, Catholics believe in purgatory, right? And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, do you want an explanation? Don't need an explanation, okay. So there was more of an emphasis upon that and upon avoiding it and not just for yourself, but for others. So uh, praying for others to avoid purgatory, right? Which sounds okay, but had a little problem, right? Probably most of you have heard about this problem, right? The sale of indulgences, okay? Yeah. Okay, but a brief explanation here is, is probably in order. Um, so during this, you know, I guess probably starting in around the 14th century, but definitely going into the 15th century, you get uh, increasing numbers of priests, mainly local priests who needed, they always needed money, okay, who decided that one way to raise money would be to ask for donations and kind of associate those donations with the granting of indulgences. It wasn't a universal practice, um, and in fact, the hierarchy of the church didn't, you know, lay down the law that now you guys sell, sell indulgences. Neither did they lay down any law prohibiting it. Okay, so what occurred was, you know, again, kind of taking advantage of the lay people who thought more in a, in a sort of slot machine kind of way about religion, that if they went to a church and, and gave a certain donation and then received an indulgence, they were all good, okay? An indulgence is a certain amount of time off in purgatory, okay? Now, this doesn't totally make sense because time and days aren't really a factor in a place like purgatory necessarily, okay? Outside of this world probably Time is irrelevant. But anyway, that's philosophic and whatnot. But, you know, so people believed that they, they could get plenary indulgences, which would let them off the hook for purgatory entirely, or they could get partial indulgences, in which case they could shorten their time in purgatory or the time of a loved one, okay? If the priest, gave, if the priest granted the indulgence, all right? So far, so good. So, yeah. Uh, keep going. Okay. <laughs> so, can you understand where the problems could lie here? Okay. What could be? There's actually two problems that I could think of. What's the probably the most obvious problem with this? Only the rich can get to hell, can avoid purgatory. Well, there's one I hadn't even thought of. But yeah, you're right. That's good. You know, the more money you have, the more time off you get. You can just keep buying those plenary If, if everyone has sin, then everyone will have to go to purgatory, mm -hmm. and only the rich can buy out of purgatory. Yeah, so. right. And everybody had sin, of course, right? No human being doesn't in this, in this theology. There's no way you've got original sin. So that definitely favors the rich. Okay. What else? I mean, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card, kind of. Uh-huh. You can kind of literally do whatever you want and act as immorally as you choose as long as you have the wealth to pay off that yeah. morality. So it sort of almost, I guess, incentivizes bad behavior. It encourages it in a way, right? Because you can always say, well, eventually I'll just get myself an indulgence. So, Or I just had an indulgence. Bigger so now. indulgence. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, it kind of fundamentally goes against what they teach on on whatever, whatever they hold mass. Uh -huh. it, in one way, you have to like try to be better, but it, and like try not to sin. Like, but this way, you can like kind of buy your way out of it. So I mean, it fundamentally goes against what they teach, which is kind of ironic. Yeah, and especially the mendicant orders would have. I mean, they were teaching something quite different, and so there was this clash of you know going on between those orders that were focused upon purity and, and spiritual development and those that had become sort of all, all, all more careerist in their orientation and will probably have to say more cynical 
about the situation. Um, anybody else want to add anything about this? Okay, well, I mean, there's lots of problems, but we've mentioned the corruption, uh, basically, of, of selling in this way. And also, though, there's this idea that with, was objectionable certainly to a growing number of people and ended up being a big objection in the Protestant Reformation, which is that a person, a human being, namely a priest, can have the power to change the will of God, okay? That a priest, you know, I mean, the, if, if indulgences were to be done right, they should have been done in the name of God and with the understanding of God's forgiveness uh, based upon repentance and not based upon one's willingness to give a donation, right? And so the donation kind of turns us towards this, this notion that it's really the priest and not God who's giving us the forgiveness, right? And so this is a real problematic and so there's this growing divide between people in the Catholic Church, which of these two perspectives um, you're going to emphasize, okay? And, and so, was, yeah, sorry. go ahead. The, the, so the individualism and the personal power focus, that's pre-Reformation that's happening, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's growing. It's, that's, that's, that's the one big point I want to make, is that this dissatisfaction with with those types of practices and also with the sort of external acts as being good enough is growing throughout the Middle Ages and you see Catholic orders emerging that are trying to purify and reform before the Reformation. Um, and in fact, it's sort of like a continuity in a way. The Reformation doesn't just come out of the blue, it's kind of the culmination of dissatisfaction. And you know, Martin Luther's attempt really was reform, right? Um, and at a certain point, the, the Reformation moved towards splitting, but not immediately. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions so far? Okay. So, the gap continues to grow between the educated minorities, which are growing, as I said, you know, there's more and more of them, but still the minority, and the masses, who are still more in the old school way of thinking, okay? Um, and so with this emphasis upon purity in the so-called elites, there, there comes to be a criticism even of the so-called good magic of the Catholic Church as perhaps not being all that important or maybe even, even being detrimental, such as veneration of the Eucharist or relics, um, which, which which we, we begin to see some questioning of as, as whether they might actually be maybe misleading people, okay? Um, veneration of the Eucharist is even, is, goes on even today. It's called adoration. So it's the idea that the Catholics believe that, you know, Christ is actually present in the Eucharist. So if that's the case, then it kind of stands to reason that it ought to be, that it ought to be adored, okay? But, but from another perspective, it sort of looked like an idolatry, okay? And so again, even within the Catholics, you begin to get some questioning of whether this is a good thing to encourage, especially if people misunderstand, which was generally the, the notion, was that the lay people could easily misunderstand what was going on there. So even if, even if you could do it right, many people were not doing it right. I think Taylor mentions at some point, you know, ideas such as, what was it? Using the Eucharist as a love charm, okay? <laughs> you see how things could quickly go south into territory that is blasphemous and misleading because the lay people don't understand well enough what it is that they're actually um, encountering, okay? Um, so, more and more, Taylor says, there's a reversal of the field of fear, okay? From fear of black magic and the need for good magic to a more pure and rational fear of God in and of itself, okay? 
this is a more direct fear. It's still fear, but basically through this, this movement to purification, they're saying, you know, what you really need to fear is not, you know, whether you, you know, do this or that properly, right? Or go venerate the Eucharist or not, or go, you know, try to make sure that your house is free of evil spirits, but rather you need to deal with God because it's God is going to decide whether you have eternal life or not, right? Um, and as I say, this was all before the Protestant Reformation, what he calls proto-reformations, okay, which are ramping up during this time, okay? And we'll be seeing plenty of hints of those proto-reformations within the second half of this course as we see these various authors questioning these aspects and moving in that direction. And you may be asking yourself from time to time, why talk about all this It's a political thought class? Well, ultimately the reason is because with the Protestant Reformation, you get not only changes in Christianity, but you get changes in politics as well. This individuation that he's talking about, right? Individual responsibility, um, the focus on no intermediary between God and man. These ideas have legs, and they get expressed in, you know, individual rights eventually, and the idea of democracy, you know, the elimination of feudal hierarchy, the elimination of special higher authority in politics. So there's a direct connection between the evolving of Christianity and the evolving political ideas. One really produces the other. In, in a, in a, to a great extent. Um, so when you read people from the Middle Ages starting to question the authority of some aspect of the Catholic Church, it's a political thought as well as a religious or theological thought, you know. Um, questioning hierarchy generally, right? Questioning authority generally. And it, it has lots of ramifications that we're still very much living with now. And in fact, one could argue, and I think he does, that what eventually happens is Christianity in the West becomes secularized through liberal democracy. Many of the principles of Christianity that come to be understood, such as, you know, everybody's equal before God, becomes equality in the political realm. All right? So if you ask yourself, for instance, why it is that we're having such an argument over whether we should allow illegal immigrants to stay in the country or you know, how tolerant we should be towards immigrants, believe me, this is a question that, is, you know, that comes out of this particular tradition right, of secularized Christianity. Most times and places not influenced by this, that question wouldn't even be asked. That doesn't make any sense to you now. Hopefully it will later on. But, you know, the Western liberal democracies hold themselves to an extremely high moral, uh, moral demand, okay? Without necessarily any reference to religion, but reflecting the development of these, these notions that come out of that past, okay? Anyway. Yeah. Could you unpack in just a second the, um, your statement that the question of the church and the authority of the church was a political statement? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Like, how does that, uh, assuming that, you know, when, I mean, we're talking about like um, monarchical kind of systems, right? Right. Was, well, how did that link up? How did that become a political thought? Well, in in a real practical way, it became a political thought because, you know, originally the church had to more or less give its blessing to the monarchs. So when that comes to be questioned, the monarchs and the hierarchy in the secular world start to ask themselves, do I need this relationship with the church? Do I need to have the pope's blessing? Well, no. And then, well, where do I get my support from? The people who are also questioning the church, right? So, so that's the concrete, you know, direct one. So, I mean, and of course, the greatest example of that is Henry VIII, but there are many others where, 
you know, the, the monarchs of Europe start to say, do I need the church? Well, the church is opposing what I want to do, so I think we'll just go with the Protestant way, <laughs> you know, so it's that kind of thing. Um, but in more general, when the human mind moves from sort of the mentality that there is authority and that to be a good person is to submit to that authority, to you no, know, maybe there's not that great authority. It just generally lends to questioning other authorities. You know, you just question the greatest authority, right? The church, the pope, okay? If you can do that, that is earthly authority, obviously. Then, then why not question any other authority? Okay. So the next in line would be the the king, the nobles. Beyond that, it might be uh, it might be the father. It might be the you know the the parental authority. Questioning of authority is like what it's the hallmark of Western civilization, right? It's rebellion, total liberty. You know, that's, that's what defines Western civilization. And it starts there, right? For better or worse, right? I mean, you can see both the downside and the upside of this. But this is the story that he's trying to tell, and that's why it's not just about, it's not just about religion, it's about politics. Um, okay, does that help so far? I mean, we'll be covering some of these things in more detail in the next part where we'll see specific examples. Um, okay. And then, so finally we get to, I want to check my time, yeah. So just one statement about the Reformation at this point, because we'll, we'll, this takes us way, way ahead of where we're actually going to be, but where Charles Taylor gets. Speaking of Luther, he says Luther, <coughs> Martin Luther, operated another reversal of the field of fear Analogous to that involved in denying church magic, the sale of indulgences was driven by a fear of punishment, but Luther's message was that we are all sinners and deserve punishment. Salvation involves facing and accepting this fully. Only in facing our full sinfulness can we throw ourselves on the mercy of God which by which alone we are justified. So really it's just another restatement in stronger terms about the need to get rid of the intermediary and deal directly with, with God. And so, and, and Luther's big slogan was justification uh, by faith alone and not by acts, remember, right? Uh, which in the Counter-Reformation, then the church basically accepted this sort of half-heartedly in a way, but it accepted it. Um, but he was, he was, uh, particularly railing against indulgences, but not only indulgences, but a lot of practices where Christians had sort of decided that what they were doing was good enough if they kind of followed what the, you know, the minimal requirements. Okay. All right. Any questions about any of that? Then. All right.